Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today we're going to talk about have we been paying enough attention to Southeast Asia? You remember Southeast Asia. Our guest for this discussion is Carl Baker, Senior Advisor at Pacific Forum. Welcome, Carl. Good to be back, Jay. It's always fun to talk about Southeast Asia, the place that uh, my, my first experience in, in Asia was, uh, was in the Philippines. So Southeast Asia has been part of my life now for about 50 years. Oh, wow. Well, you, you can give us the on the ground view of it. So what, you know, what's the situation here? Have we been paying, go to the question of the show, have we been paying enough attention to Southeast Asia? Or are we sort of mm, spending our time on other things? Well, you know, uh, we, we've we've talked about Southeast Asia for a long time. That Southeast Asia is important. It's it's the new engine of the global economy, and uh, you know, we've had the pivot, we've had the rebalance, we've talked about how to move our attention to to Southeast Asia. But honestly, I think what we're where we're stuck is Southeast Asia is there somewhere, but China is the bright spot and everything is sort of refracted through how we see China and, and Southeast Asia becomes almost a, a, a player in, in how we think about China. And so when we think about Southeast Asia, our, our, our primary interest, I think, and when I say our, I mean Americans' in, interest is in China and, and Southeast Asia is important, but we, it's important because it's part of that competition with China. Yeah, with China, it's, it's not only competition, but threat. It's military threat. It's threat to our interests. Southeast Asia, would you agree with me? Southeast Asia is not a threat to our interests. Whatever it is, whatever it isn't, it's not a threat, right? No, it's not a threat. But I would, I would, I would change your characterization that, that it's, it's a military threat. In Southeast Asia, the real competition is the economic security, the, 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 the Southeast, and this is part of the problem, is the way the Southeast Asians view what's happening between China and the United States is they, they say, well, you know, the United States has always been the security guarantor, but China is the economic driver. China is the economic engine. It is the one that has the, 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 the huge trade imbalances in, in Southeast Asia. They're the biggest trading partner for virtually every country in Southeast Asia, with the exception of the Philippines in recent years, because of the, the, the shifting politics in the Philippines. But for all the other countries in Southeast Asia, they are loath to give up that economic relationship with, with China because their, their well-being, their economic security depends on it. So I think the Americans fail to understand that, that that's the driving force. And now the United States likes to present China as a military threat to the point where, where I've had, I've had uh, American government interlocutors who tell me, you, got, you just don't understand how important it is. What would happen if China invaded Southeast Asia? But China isn't going to invade Southeast Asia. China has an economic relationship with Southeast Asia that doesn't require an military invasion they have they have the economic relationship that is much more important to them and much more important to the southeast asians so while the americans always try to try to characterize this as a military issue it it really isn't and part of the reason i think why the americans want to treat it as a military issue is because they as i said earlier they are have always been the security guarantor the, the sort of policemen that will take care of things when things go bad. So when you have a terrorism problem in Southeast Asia, the Americans are there to provide training and to provide, uh, you know, military force if needed. And, and they, they maintain the open sea lanes of communication. So that's an important part for the, for the United States. But, and that's why the naval power in Asia, the American naval power in Asia is important. But the military threat to Southeast Asia is is the concern that the Americans and the Chinese might do something in Southeast Asia. They don't see China as as a threat to their existence. Yeah, let's drill down a little. When you say um, you know economic dependency relationship, what have you? You know, are you talking about trade? You're talking about you know consumer goods. Um, you're talking about manufacturing capability. Um, 
What, what is it that makes this relationship? It's, it's largely, it's largely uh, raw materials as well as components for assembly. China is the assembler of the world, as we know. And, and Southeast Asia is the component maker of the world. And so what's happened is you have, you have these, these components being manufactured in Southeast Asia shipped to China. And, and China also, of course, takes in a lot of natural resources, a lot of uh, agriculture products from, from Southeast Asia. So that's the relationship. And, and uh, the Southeast Asians, sure, they take cheap, uh, cheap Chinese uh, consumer goods, just like the rest of the world. But the, but the relationship is primarily components into China as the assembler. Yeah, the question about the components, electronic components, components for manufactured equipment, goods, what have you, mm -hmm. um, th that wasn't the case 20 years ago. Uh, maybe, you know, fewer years than that. Um, somewhere along the line, Southeast Asia has become the component manufacturer for China. How long ago did that happen? And it's been how going, reliable is it? it? It's been going on for, for 20, 25 years. Really, when you look at, at, at in the early 2000s, this is when it started. And, you know, and, and again, the, I think the shift actually occurs in the 97 finan Asian financial crisis. That's when, that's when Asians saw that the Americans weren't going to bail them out. So it was, it was initially a, a financial issue with, with the banks failing, with the currencies in Southeast Asia failing. And China was seen as stepping up and providing, providing Southeast Asia with, with mechanisms that would allow them to, to get their currency back on the footing, get, get their economies restarted after the Asia financial crisis. And so I think that, that, again, somewhere between 97 and 2007, 2008, when you have the global financial crisis, that, that really the, the transition to depending on China for economic well-being started taking place in Southeast Asia. And, and why, can't, why can't the U.S. become an economic partner in the same way? Have we missed the boat on that? Is there something we can or should do? Uh, to well, compete with China's economic relationship with Southeast Asia? Well, yeah, yes, I think that's that's basically what we're trying to do with this with this uh, this this uh, IPEF, the in Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, and all the talk about about sanctioning and moving offshoring and friendshoring uh, supply chains into Southeast Asia. So Vietnam has been very much a benefit. A beneficiary of that move in the United States to to move the supply chains out of China into into Southeast Asia. So basically, what that amounts to is what you're suggesting is you simply cut China out of the out of the loop, and and they're no longer the assembler. But you do now do assembly in Southeast Asia also. So you you, you basically secure United States supply chains by going directly to Southeast Asia allowing Southeast Asia to manufacture the component as well as assemble it into, into finished product. So that's why you see big trade imbalances between the United States and Vietnam and United States and Thailand, because that's where it's happening, and, and increasingly in Indonesia, because that's, that's the focus for the United States. Philippines, again, I, I treat Philippines as a bit of a separate issue because they're very locked into a, a stronger relationship with not only the United States, but also Japan. And, and you know so so they're they're they've always been less dependent on China than the other countries although having said that you know the, the exports from the Philippines 70% uh, of the exports from the Philippines are electronic components and most of those these days go to either Korea or to China yeah you, you're mentioning countries and I uh, I would like to itemize list the, the the countries that we consider in southeast asia and i'll put a map on the screen um what what countries are we talking about yeah well i mean southeast asia has has somewhat become defined by the association for southeast asian nations asean and and there's there's 10 countries in asean and and they are the philippines vietnam cambodia laos myanmar malaysia Indonesia, Singapore, and Brunei. 
and then and then you have Timor Leste, which of course is, is used to be part of Indonesia. It's now a separate country, and it's been trying to become part of ASEAN for years. Supposedly, this is going to happen next year. That that Timor Leste will become the eleventh ASEAN nation, and so that's really the countries that we, we talk about. You know, there's there's nothing hard and fast about that, but those are the those are the major countries. Of course, there's Papua New Guinea out there, and there's some Pacific islands out there that, that aren't that are, are nearby but not considered part of Southeast Asia. And so those those are the countries that, that we typically refer to when we talk about Southeast Asia. It's it's basically the ASEAN countries because they have created, you know, ASEAN has created a, a economic community, a, a political security community, and, and a social cultural community. And they've worked very hard at, at building a, a regional identity through through ASEAN. Over the past few years, you know, we we seem to have distance ourselves from uh, earlier, more active involvement in trying to build bridges with Southeast Asia and the whole pivot affair. Um, and we seem to be preoccupied with politics. I mean, if I give you a president who is busy all day with wars in the Middle East, with wars in uh, Eastern Europe, um, with terrible politics every single day, every single day uh, at home, uh, how can that president really address issues which are really in the second tier of attention, and that is issues regarding Southeast Asia? Have we have we been paying enough attention, or have we been preoccupied? Yeah, I think I think we've been preoccupied with uh, with as you say with with other other parts of the world because the United States has has to be involved in in all parts of the world in in the American in the American mindset that uh, sort of set in during the Cold War and was solidified in the 90s during the so-called unipolar moment. And I think that, that we have been preoccupied with other areas. And like I said, it's, 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 it's always been sort of alliance-based and it's been, it's been very much security partner-based and it's always sort of lacked an economic, a, a strong, vibrant economic component. And so, you know, when we talk about the relationships in Southeast Asia, the first thing we talk about is the alliances, you know, and, and the alliances, of course, are two. It's Vietnam, or sorry, the Philippines and Thailand. And, and Thailand, of course, isn't very eager to talk about the alliance relationship with the United States. Uh, the United States is because it sees it as a, as a security partner in that sense. The Philippines has blown hot and cold on that alliance partnership uh, over the years. Right now, it seems like it's very strong again. And then there's the, uh, the, the security partnership with, with Singapore, which really does its best to play off both China and the United States. So yeah, I think, I think that, that the United States has focused, and even when it's focused on Asia, it tends to focus on Northeast Asia, Japan and South Korea. You know, for, for a long time, uh, the, the, the conflict on the Korean Peninsula has sucked up a lot of energy from the United States and trying to build a bigger security relationship with Japan has, has done that in the last 10 years. That, that, that has been a, a focal point. And now with, with China, in, at least in the American view, emerging as a military competitor, they call it a pacing, a pacing threat these days, uh, you know, China has, has soaked up a lot of the attention. And that's why Southeast Asia has has now gained some some recognition in as as an important region for the United States, but largely through the prism of the threat from China. Well, you know, you talk about security guarantees and the importance of the U.S. as a security guarantor in the, in the region. Uh, how well has the United States done? I mean, for example, uh, it doesn't seem that um, we are really standing behind Taiwan all that much. And it doesn't seem that we are standing behind free shipping in the South China Sea. And the Philippines is in, in large part on its own in that regard. Um, and, and of course, we, if we didn't really step in and help anybody in Hong Kong. So, you know, the impression I would get if I was in one of those uh, Southeast Asian countries you mentioned would be, well, the US, you know, used to be a security guarantor, but of late, 
you know, it doesn't seem to be performing that role with any enthusiasm. What do you think? That's a that's a somewhat fair criticism. Uh, on the other hand, you know, when in in the discussions that we've had in in Southeast Asia, there's always the expectation that even though the United States hasn't, you know, stepped up in in Hong Kong or stepped up here, or stepped up there, when there's when there's an issue about maritime spaces, about about China encroaching on maritime spaces or the potential for maritime conflict, they still see the United States as the, the, the big global maritime power that will defend sea lines of communication, international waters. And, and, and coastal waters, uh, everybody, everybody recognizes that, that the whole issue of coastal, coastal waters, territorial claims is, is a bit of a separate issue, but they still see the United States as the one that's going to come in and solve problems. So for example, with Vietnam, you know, we we did a we did a tabletop exercise with the Vietnam with the Vietnamese a couple of years ago, you know, and there was an issue about a uh, conflict in in the Spratly Islands, which Vietnam makes a, makes a claim to, the uh, Philippines makes a claim to, and China makes a claim to, and and when there was when there was a, a potential conflict, the Vietnamese immediately said, well, the United States will take the issue to China, you know, and we can just sort of wait and see once how we want to play this. You know, in Indonesia the same way. They said, well, we expect the United States will be there to challenge China in international waters. And we'll we'll see how we can how we can manage our situation for territorial rights and all that stuff based on how the United States acts. So there's still this sense that the United States is the guarantor. And with with Philippines the same way, you know, even more so, where they see the United States as the as the country that will continue to do you know, freedom of navigation operations through the South China Sea to establish the, the, the free and the, 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 the free shipping through that region. So I think that there still is that that recognition. But you're you're correct when you say that there there is a loss of of faith in how far the United States is willing to go to protect the the interests of the individual countries. Because what they see the United States as being really interested in is maintaining uh, sea lanes of communication for their own purposes, not so much for, for the Philippines' purposes or Vietnam's purposes, but for their own purposes. And so they, they, they you know, they've taken they've taken their their cue from from Donald Trump that we're going to look out for America's interests first. Mm, yeah, well, uh, but but going back to the nature of. U.S. involvement in all these places of conflict. You know, in Afghanistan, we left. We got tired of it, and we left, and we left badly, I, I have to say. Um, in, um, you know, in, in uh, Ukraine, we really haven't put boots on the ground, and we've been very uh, unpredictable mm -hmm. and uh, unreliable in terms of providing money and uh, weapons, and, and even in getting other countries in Europe to provide money and Weapon. So it's, it's not clear, you know, just how reliable we are. Well, it is clear. We're not reliable. And, and then, of course, you have, uh, you know, Israel, which is on again, off again. And I am thinking of the, that, um, that bridge of pontoons that was supposed to deliver uh, humanitarian aid to Gaza. It failed. It failed and they tried so hard to make it work, but it failed. Um, and, you know, it's right now it's being taken somewhere else. And all these uh, carriers, you know, trillion dollars worth of carriers were out there. They didn't actually stay there. They're gone. Um, so, you know, we, we're kind of an observer uh, of recent and we don't put boots on the ground. We, we don't seem to actually engage. Uh, we give money sometimes unpredictably. We give weapons sometimes unpredictably. We usually it's transactional what we do. Um, and if I was a, you know, an observer in Southeast Asia or otherwise, I, I would say, hmm, is this something I can rely on? Because the people in Ukraine really have not, have not been able to rely on it. And the people in Israel, well, yes, to a certain extent, but not, not in the way they had hoped. Um, and so um, what, I'm, what I'm really asking is if to the extent that uh, the people in Asia, Southeast Asia, feel that the U.S. is a guarantor of security. Is that more historic than current? Because recent events would seem to suggest the other way. 
uh, of course it's historic, but it's also it's also current. But it's an but it's an evolved current, and that's what I was trying to explain. Is is they still see the United States as a security guarantor, but it's more increasingly more viewed as well. It's really protecting U.S. interests, not so much our interests. Where yeah, you know I think that that's that's really where that where where it has shifted. So it's still the security guarantor, but it's but it's more of security guarantor because the United States is in the in the terminology of UNCLOS is a user state in the maritime spaces and not a not a coastal state that has territorial and and real deep interests in protecting territorial space. And you know, and I I mean I think really when you look at Southeast Asia, this is a lesson that they probably learned back in around 1975 mm-hmm. or so. <laughs> well, obviously uh, speaking... referring referring to the pullout from from Vietnam. You, you mentioned isolationism and, um, you know, the, uh, there's a fair chance that the, the Trump mega GOP will, will win this election and implement all those policies that he likes uh, and, and uh, Vance likes. And that, that should be, I think, uh, a cause for some concern, not only in Europe, not only in the Middle East, but, but a, a cause for concern in Asia and Southeast Asia because... Um, talk about uh, security, uh, talk about economic connections, um, talk about, you know, um, American presence, if you will, in one way or the other. Uh, the isolationist view would not really support that. Um, talk about immigration, talk about people from Southeast Asia want to come to the United States. Um, that the ice, the the isolationist view would really not support that. We're closing the door here, and the Trump administration should it should it succeed in the election or otherwise, um, the Trump administration would would be the isolationism would be across the board, and it would not just be limited to you know what is presently at issue with, at the Mexican border. Um, it would be everywhere in terms of trade and immigration. Don't you think? Uh, I think it's an interesting point, but to me, I mean, when you look at at Asia and the difference between the Democrats and and the Republicans, and I think we can say that that the Republicans are now Trump. I mean, if you've been watching anything in the last couple of days, it's very clear that that the Republicans have very much consolidated around Donald Trump as as the Republican Party, and. The difference, I think, between the Democrats and the Republicans in Asia, specifically, is that both sides see China as a very existential threat to U.S. interests. The difference is, is that the Democrats see building relationships in Southeast Asia, building building on the alliances that exist in Southeast Asia, building on the security partnerships is beneficial to countering China. I think that Trump administration and, and Vance in particular, from what I've seen, is very much of the mind that the United States just needs to build a strong military and it alone can defeat China and, and content, can compete with China. And, and this, of course, is a big fear in Southeast Asia, is that there will be spillover when, when this big, powerful United States and big, powerful China decide to start trampling around in the in the elephant grass of Southeast Asia, yeah. Well, I, uh, don't you think that's exactly what would happen? Everybody would be drawn into it some way. Yeah, it would it would become more and more difficult for China or for for Southeast Asia countries, which are are have been very adept at at creating opportunities on both sides by playing the other the, the two off from each other. I mean, that's really the origin of ASEAN. Was, was the ASEAN countries, the, the original five members of ASEAN, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, and, and Singapore came together, and Thailand came together with the purpose of trying to protect their interests in the context of the Cold War. You know, post post Vietnam and everything, there was a, there was a big concern. So so that was really their intent of. of of creating ASEAN. So I think that, yes, the, the Southeast Asian countries are, are very much concerned that this could become the real security threat to Southeast Asia, that they won't be able to play off 
and, and that it'll spill over into the region. I might add one other thing, and that is uh, you talked about component uh, manufacturing and manufacturing, you know, assembly manufacturing in Southeast Asia over time. Um, but the American isolationist faction would never, uh, they would put tariffs on that. But more than that, they would, they would really resent the idea that there was manufacturing going on in Southeast Asia because they want to keep it here at home, even yeah. if it's not relevant anymore. Yeah. You've seen this in the last couple of days where there was a lot of talk about Taiwan stealing the, the semiconductor market. And, uh, and, and certainly Vietnam and Thailand have huge trade imbalances with the United States. And so they are already expressing concern about trying to, trying to maintain a, a healthy, from their perspective, a healthy relationship with the United States. And that's why Vietnam is, is really working hard to, to talk about a strategic partnership with, with the United States, trying to maintain that, that relationship because they recognize they have a, they have a, a looming problem if, if we really get serious about, about all these tariffs and uh, restricting manufacturing to the United States and the shore of, of the United States. Yeah, that would be a problem. Anyway, um, I, w I would like to discuss with you some of the factors that affect uh, the thinking, including economic thinking and political thinking in Southeast Asia. Uh, and um, for example, you know, there were, there were, uh, a number of stories about floods and and deaths over floods, uh, rainstorms, and very serious floods, which is no surprise these days in in the in the in the, in the time of uh, climate change. But that you know that can be a big problem. It was a huge problem in Pakistan, mm -hmm. and I think it's a big problem in in Southeast Asia, isn't it? People aside from you know the ruination of villages and and businesses in small cities, um, people dying. It, it's not good for the economy. It's not good for their worldview um, to have these uh, climate change um, type events, no? Not at all. I mean, the, the, real, the real concern this year in, in Southeast Asia has been this, this overwhelming heat wave that they've, they've suffered through. It, it's, it's just been unbearably hot all over Southeast Asia. And of course, you know, when you talk about the effects of climate change, you've got you've got two cities specifically in a, in Southeast Asia, but Bangkok and Jakarta, that have a very great risk of becoming completely inundated by by rising rising ocean levels. You know, so so Jakarta and Bangkok are both sinking into the ocean, literally. You know, and so yeah, there's a huge concern around Southeast Asia. Those two in particular, but but all the countries are concerned about. You know, there, there's always been this this problem of haze from people burning fields in in, uh, in in Indonesia and the haze spreading over over the rest of Southeast Asia. So there's a huge amount of concern over over the the impact yeah. of, of climate change. And, and again, this goes back to their real concern over economic security. Ultimately, each, each country in Southeast Asia has, has a huge concern with, with economic security. Yeah, there was an article recently about the, uh, the, the Chinese haze, the Chinese haze that drifts out of China with the manufacturing there and comes over Southeast Asia. I mean, it, it, this is also part of climate change, but it's also part of ignoring climate change. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, the, the title of our show is, are we paying enough attention to Southeast Asia, but are we paying enough attention to climate change? Because the problems that, that we see in the newspaper, and which we're talking about, they're not going to get better because, you know, the world such as it is, the global leadership is really not doing anything about climate change. And so it's getting worse every week, every, every month, maybe every day um, in every place including Southeast Asia, which is, I think, the way the topography works is very vulnerable. So I would go beyond saying they are concerned. They must be concerned about the future. This is not geopolitical. This is, you know, beyond the point of man-made. This is, this is nature. And it's going to have an increasing effect on everything, especially in Southeast Asia, no? 
Yeah, well, sure. Yeah, I mean, and and again, Southeast Asia has always been much more concerned about you know satisfaction of basic needs in in their populations and and concerns over 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 food security and and broadly economic security. So this has always been a concern there. Uh, now, having said that, you know, in some ways, Southeast Asia is probably ahead of the United States in in their green energy. They've they've been much more aggressive in in trying to trying to limit fossil fuels and and they've been trying to transition to to clean energy. Uh, I mean, clearly there's there's still a huge problem, especially in Indonesia that uses an outrageous amount of coal and 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 uh, fossil other fossil fuels. But they're they're certainly concerned about it. They're they're trying to fix the problem, and and they they recognize that that. They need that assistance, and so you know one of the one of the bright spots for the United States, I think, is that there has been a recognition that green green energy is important, and that they've been trying to finance, trying to provide financing for that through the multilateral banks, Asia Development Bank, World Bank, and and to some extent through bilateral assistance from from the United States. So there is some. There is there certainly is a recognition. Certainly, the Southeast Asians recognize it as a problem, and and uh, you know that's a, I think an area of opportunity in the United States. Uh, but you know, with with what appears to be happening now, it seems unlikely that that's going to be sustained. Well, I'd like to go back to your 50 years of on the ground in Southeast Asia just for a moment, and tell you about two disparate things that. Um, that sort of, for me, they define what's happening there on the ground. Uh, one is a, a YouTube series called Ella's Daily Life. You know, if you have a chance, Carl, you should take a look at it. It's all over YouTube. And it's about a young woman who lives in a village who is, um, you know, probably around 20, married with a couple of kids, uh, living in a, a very modest home. Um, who goes on these uh, projects out into the jungle and she finds crops growing natively of all kinds uh, from agricultural crops that grow in the jungle to animal crops to fish crops and she brings them to market and she sells them in market. This is what she does every day and the camera follows her and she is, um, uh, she was, there's something about her that's, that's so benign and sweet uh, she never looks at the camera, but the camera is always looking at her and giving you establishment shots of how it is in her small village, in the market, in her village, in the jungle where she goes. Uh, and it is so touching because you say to yourself, gee, this is, this is a beautiful thing. Uh, she's a beautiful individual. The, the family and the, and the, and the village and the, and the market, they're all, they're all so appealing. And they live in 2024 um, and they're having a nice life and they're not they're not in Bangkok, but they're somewhere in rural Thailand. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, so I, I suggest that to you just for an interesting experience. The other thing, and I don't know if there's a connection at all, is that um, was it six people died of poison in the Grand Hyatt a couple of days ago. Um, they were, some of them were American Vietnamese, other, was, other ones were not um, American, but were Vietnamese. Um, and they were, they were all killed. Um, and this is not dissimilar from a, a, a mass murder that took place in uh, one of the hotels in the Philippines, in, in uh, Manila, only a few weeks ago. So uh, I guess that's, that's a statement of just exactly how safe it is. And, what kind of you know street security um, does Southeast Asia have these days, and whether it's worth visiting or not? Um, and so I don't I don't have a connection. Maybe you can find a connection between these two disparate um, stories. Well, I don't know that there is. I don't I don't think there is a connection. I mean, if I if I am reading the news correctly, the. The, the incident in Bangkok was probably a business deal gone bad, and uh, and it was it looks like it was probably a, a suicide murder, uh, from from all the all the indications that I've seen in, in the news stories. The the Philippines the Philippines thing was 
just sort of a random, uh, I'll try, I, I see it as somewhat of a random, random act that, that I, I can't, I can't figure out what was, what was the real motivation there. It's, it's hard to tell sometimes. Uh, but There's something in the news about how he was a disgruntled employee of the, ho of the hotel. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I, that's why, yeah, my, my inclination is, is that those, those kinds of things happen and, and sure they happen in Southeast Asia too, but for the most part, I think that, that, you know, I mean, you, the, the, the bucolic life you describe of this woman in rural Asia, I mean, I think that that is very, very typical once you get outside the big cities that it's certainly, you certainly don't feel, feel the, the threat of violence in those areas. I think it, I have never, I have never felt concern for my life in, in any of the cities in Asia for that matter. But even at, once you get outside the city, even less so, the people are friendly and they're, they're perfectly willing to, to help foreigners that look like they're lost, which sometimes I look when I'm in those places probably, you know, so I, I think that, that, you know, the law and order is not is not really, I think, a big issue in, in the Asian, in the big Southeast Asian cities. They, they seem to have it fairly well under control. The, the policemen certainly don't swagger around with, you know, 10 pounds of equipment hanging off themselves. So like you see, like you see in the United States, you know, they're, they're much more integrated into the community, sort of along the lines of, of Japan, where where the policeman is seen as as somebody who helps people, not somebody who intimidates people. Yeah, uh, and so you know, I think that that that's that's really sort of the, the feeling that I get when I go to these when I when I go to Southeast Asia. I certainly always feel feel very very secure and not concerned if I have to go walk outside at night that somebody's going to accost me or something like that. I think that those those I, I'm sure there's parts of cities that where you could go where that would be a problem. But, for the most part, I think that Southeast Asia is always, a, to me, a fun place to go to, and, and it's certainly an eye-opening place to go to, where you see, where you still see those open markets that you're describing, where where people are literally gathering things out of the forest and taking them to the market to sell to to the city. Well, you know, just talking with you now, Carl, it does there's something that occurs to me. It's the media. You know, uh, this the movies of uh, Ellis' daily life are really, really good. If you go on YouTube, you will see what I mean. They're, they're first class yeah. movies. They're very watchable. There's no dialogue at all. No, very little sound. It's just Ella. And she's not the only one. Mm -hmm. This is uh, proliferating around YouTube. Um, so it's it, the remarkable thing about it is it's available to you and me, to the world to see what Ella is doing and to see it in a first class movie rendition. The other aspect, and I think it is connected in some way, is that if you want to know the news about what's going on in Southeast Asia, in any city, any country in Southeast Asia, it's easy. You, you know, you go not only to YouTube, but you go to the newspapers, they're all online. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you about these incidents in the hotels and everything else. It's an open book. I don't remember it being like that before. Well, no. I mean, remember back uh, back when I first started going to Asia, if you wanted to make a call to the United States, you had to go to the telephone company and re reserve a booth, and the operator would connect you to the number, and it would cost you two dollars a minute to talk. <laughs> Where now you can you can pick up your your phone and talk to somebody for free on WhatsApp. I come away with the thought that this is a very appealing place, much more appealing, much more safe, much more worthy of, you know, uh, tourist planning than, for example, the Middle East or North Africa yeah. or Latin America for that, for that matter. And so they have retained a certain cultural uh, appeal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can only hope that it continues. And I know you feel the same way. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I always enjoy going to Southeast Asia. It's, uh... Once you once you get once you get into the country, you feel very very much that uh, they welcome you, and so it's, uh, it's always fun to to go try new things in these places. Well, thank you, Carl. Carl Baker, senior advisor at Pacific Forum, helping us understand what's going on there, and what the U.S. relationship and prospects are with regard to both uh, diplomacy, economics, 
and security guarantees for Southeast Asia. Thank you, Carl. Thanks. Thank you.